Hey Crashers! Well, we've made it through our time traveling journey and have returned to the present. Or at least we will, mostly by the end of today's episode. So the last 15 to 20 years have been a really exciting time for comics, as the industry has built itself from the ground up. This episode has been a little weird for me to write because, well, I've been in the middle of it. For me, this isn't research so much as what I've observed over the past decade or two. I mean, I did research too, but you get the point. Anyway, today I'm going to discuss what I see as some of the most important trends of the last two decades that have shaped the present moment in comics. And so the first trend is most obviously embodied these days by Marvel's cinematic universe. But transmedia marketing campaigns by comics companies didn't spring fully formed from the head of Kevin Feige. In fact, transmedia marketing has been part of superhero comics since their inception. Superman almost immediately became a radio show, film serials, and was even a TV show very early in TV's existence. I'm talking about the 40s and 50s, not the Christopher Reeves movies of the 1970s. And then there were swaths of Saturday morning cartoons in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And in the late 80s and 90s, we began to see a rebirth of screen adaptations of superhero comics, with the Batman film series beginning in 1989, and then a series of successful cartoons that begin with the critically acclaimed Batman the Animated Series and the beloved X-Men the Animated Series. So, things really begin to change, though, around the turn of the century. In 2000, the first of the X-Men movies hits the big screen, followed in 2002 by the first of the Spider-Man movies. Now, both of these series might have ended pretty poorly, but their initial incarnations were a revelation. We finally had access to special effects to tell live-action superhero stories effectively, and they could be told in a way that both dedicated fans and general audiences responded to. And then the Dark Knight series begins in 2005, and in 2008, Iron Man. Now, Iron Man was revolutionary not just in retrospect as the beginning of something that's really unheard of, this interconnected world of comic book movies spanning over a decade coming to a head in a literal, genuine crossover movie, but also taking someone who was, at the time, kind of a B-list superhero to anyone outside of pretty dedicated Marvel fans, and having faith that his story would resonate with audiences. And forget Iron Man, freaking Rocket Raccoon? Are you kidding me? <laughs> anyway, it's hard to know exactly what the effects of these movies on the comic book industry are, because I've seen people look at the same sales statistics and interpret them completely differently. Anecdotally, I've had a lot of people ask me about the comics and even grab a volume or two of important stories because they love the movies or characters from the movies. Now, clearly not everyone who sees the movies reads the comics, or the industry would be insane, but it's hard to believe that no one who reads comics now wasn't inspired to get into them from the films. Now, whether they become long-term readers in the classic sense, say by subscribing to a current ongoing, is perhaps a different question than whether the movies do inspire fans to turn to the comics at all. And I think that's where the arguments come from, people disagreeing about what it means for a movie fan to read the comics. But these past years haven't been all about the big two, or even about superhero comics. In fact, a lot of the most innovative and exciting material in comics is coming from the alternative and independent publishers. So while Image's output was originally like an independently owned version of superhero Marvel and DC kind of comics, these days Image publishes creator-owned work in all genres and in all visual styles. And they have competition in other publishers like IDW, Dark Horse, Oni, and many more. Heck, Mike Mignola's Hellboy is now a full-fledged fictional universe as complicated and multifaceted as many superhero universes and has three or four ongoing titles to boot. Uh, and not to mention a couple of movie adaptations while we're at it. But more traditional alternative comics have also flourished. In 1992, Mouse won a Pulitzer Prize, and opened a lot of non-comic fans' eyes to the idea that comics could be a serious art form. Since then, Mouse has become a required reading in many college and high school classrooms, and other important graphic memoirs have followed in Mouse's footsteps, perhaps most notably Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis and Alison Bechdel's Fun Home. Now, interest in these texts has increased interest in alternative comics more broadly, and artists like Art Spiegelman, Chris Ware, Daniel Klaus, and others are regularly featured in really high-profile publications like The New Yorker. And this growth of societal and critical respect for comics as an art form is due in no small part to Scott McCloud, whose 1993 book Understanding Comics is still one of the most accessible primers when it comes to explaining what's special about the comics form. And that cool stuff about the comics form? That's the next series.
While people have been studying comics for decades, McLeod's text is often seen as a kind of ground zero for the field of comic studies, especially in the United States, in large part because he made the discussion accessible to people who figured comics were just about buff dudes in tights. Comic studies has since become a serious and vigorous field of academic study, and you can attend comic studies classes in colleges across the nation, attend conferences, and subscribe to academic journals dedicated to the field. In fact, you can minor in comic studies at my alma mater, the University of Oregon. I even ran the program during the 2016 academic year. So I would argue that one of the biggest events in American comics in the past 20 years actually has to do with, well, Japanese comics. Manga. And I'm not even talking about the visual influence of manga on American comics, which is a whole other thing. So manga has been in some form or fashion popular in the US since at least the 1980s, but really began to grow in popularity in the late 1990s uh, in no small part due to the popularity of anime, Japanese animation. Now, one of the issues with translating manga is that while English is read from left to right, Japanese is read from right to left. So that means that the panels also flow in the opposite direction of the English panels. So for years, the solution was simply to flip manga, to mirror it so that it read in English format. This meant that any text, including sound effects, signs, logos, stuff on t-shirts, had to be completely erased and overlaid because, well, they were backwards. It also meant that the art was kind of changed. Sometimes it's pretty subtle, but sometimes not, and a lot of artists weren't happy with the idea of their carefully crafted pages getting essentially flipped over and refused to allow their work to be translated. Now, all the extra work involved in flipping and rewriting meant that translated manga also tended to be pretty expensive. Think like $20 a volume. So in 2002, one publisher, Tokyo Pop, decided to take a risk with a program they called 100% Authentic Manga. They printed the books on cheaper paper and at a smaller digest size, so it looked a little bit more like collections of manga did in Japan. But more importantly, they decided not to flip the books. Instead, they put notes in the front and back explaining how to read the book from right to left and hoped that for a $5 to $10 price tag, people would be willing to experiment. And, well, they were. And artists were more willing to have their text translated, too. So I worked in bookstores around this time, and I can tell you that I watched the manga section go from a shelf at the end of sci-fi to a whole bookshelf to a whole wall. And the audience also tended to skew younger, and a larger percentage of the readership was female than often was the case with traditional comic book shops. And it didn't take long for American publishers to see that fans were willing to buy comic books in this digest format in bookstores. Now, I don't know exactly how much manga has to do with that exactly, but it was also around the same time that more and more trade paperback collections of American comics started showing up in bookstores as well, where the direct market had destroyed a general audience in favor of a niche community, suddenly a more general audience was again opening up in bookstores. Someone might not want to go to a comic book shop, but feel at home in a bookstore. And remember, this is the same time, from 2002 to 2005, that X-Men, Spider-Man, and the Batman movies were huge in the box office. So, this generalist community has found new expression as well in the growth of young adult comics, published and even distributed by book producers like Scholastic. They exist almost entirely outside of the traditional comic book industry, and are more a part of the book industry, and... It's working. You know who the best-selling comic book artist of the last few years has been? It's no one from Marvel or DC. It's Raina Telgemeier, publishing her excellent young adult and kids comics like Smile through Scholastic. And then there's the internet. Being a fan once required specialist knowledge. Finding a community at cons or comic book shops with whom you could share information. Now, with the internet, those communities became virtual, and you didn't have to find an old comic book or a wise comic sage to figure out something. You could look it up. You could find other people around you who liked what you liked, who wanted to talk with you about your favorite characters, no matter what time it was or where they lived. Communities that felt out of place in public arenas like conventions or comic book shops could create spaces for themselves online. And online spaces tend to skew slightly more female. For example, according to a Pew study, 80% of women use social media compared to 73% of men. And that percentage goes up way higher in creative fan spaces. 80 to 85% of fan fiction readers and authors identify as female. 
Now, the internet, of course, also allows people to publish their own work outside of the strictures of traditional publishing. So we've seen a huge wave of creators in publishing work online and then being discovered by traditional publishers. But some internet creators never need to go mainstream, as their internet following allows them to make a living their own way. Now, these last few points I've talked about mean that the creative community and readership of comics appears more diverse than it has for many years. Note that I use the word appears. Sometimes you'll hear internet curmudgeons complain about this, saying that publishers are caving to market pressures and only publishing titles or artists to appeal to PC concerns to look diverse and get brownie points. Did my expression give away my feelings? Look, what I think is this. When we look at the golden age, we know that readership was insanely diverse. Statistics tell us that 80 to 90% of kids under 18 in 1940 read comics. 80 to 90%. That means white, black, brown, Asian, gay, straight, everyone. And there were a huge diversity of genres, too. Styles, titles, everything. It wasn't perfect, I'm not saying that. But due to the social pressures of the moral panic and then the economic pressures of the direct market, the comics community shifted, at least on the surface, visually. But if you really look, if you read the letters pages of comics from the 60s and 70s, if you look at SF and Comic-Cons, what you see is that the readers who have suddenly appeared, apparently, have actually been there all along. They just weren't the focus, and they didn't have a voice. So thanks to the shifts in market realities and social expectations, hey, we've got a voice in the industry. And I can't help but think that that's a good thing. Anyway, that's the comics world as I see it. As I mentioned, this isn't history yet. It's something still being written. And I'm just in on one corner. But I can't wait to see what's coming next. See you next time. I hope you've been enjoying Comics Crash Course. If you'd like to help us out, I encourage you to click like, to tell your friends to check out our channel, and as always, to hit subscribe.